హలో గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ గుడ్ ఆఫ్టర్నూన్ అండ్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ టు అవర్ డిస్టింగ్స్ స్పీకర్స్ చేర్స్ అండ్ వండర్ఫుల్ ఆడియన్సెస్ ఆఫ్ ఎస్ఎన్ఎస్ వెబినార్స్ వి ఆర్ బ్యాక్ అగైన్ విత్ అనదర్ సెట్ ఆఫ్ ఇన్సైట్ఫుల్ లెక్చర్స్ జస్ట్ ఫర్ యూ ద ఫస్ట్ స్పీకర్ ఫర్ టుడే ఇస్ అవర్ ఆన్ గెస్ట్ ఫ్రమ్ లుజైన్ స్విట్జర్లాండ్ ప్రొఫెసర్ రాయ్ థామస్ డానియల్ ప్రొఫెసర్ డానియల్ హూ ఒరిజినల్లీ హెయిల్స్ ఫ్రమ్ ఇండియా కంప్లీటెడ్ ఇస్ న్యూరో సర్జరీ ఫ్రమ్ ద క్రిస్టియన్ మెడికల్ కాలేజ్ వెల్లూర్ హీ జాయిన్ ది సెల్మా మెట్ర యాజ్ అన్ అసోసియేట్ ప్రొఫెసర్ ఆఫ్ న్యూరో సర్జరీ బిఫోర్ బీంగ్ అపాయింటెడ్ ఫుల్ ప్రొఫెసర్ దేర్ ఇన్ టూ థౌసండ్ సిక్స్ హీ జాయిన్ ది డిపార్ట్మెంట్ ఆఫ్ క్లినికల్ న్యూరో సైన్స్ అట్ ద హాస్పిటల్ సెంటర్ వార్డ్ యూనివర్సిటీ లుజైన్ ఇన్ టూ థౌసండ్ నైన్ యాజ్ అ విజిటింగ్ ప్రొఫెసర్ అండ్ అసిస్టెంట్ ఫిజిషియన్ ఇన్ న్యూరో సర్జరీ సర్వీస్ అట్ ద సిహెచ్యూవి హిస్ క్లినికల్ రెస్పాన్సిబిలిటీస్ కవర్డ్ స్కల్ బేస్ సర్జరీ అండ్ వాస్కులర్ సర్జరీ హీ వాస్ ప్రమోటెడ్ టు ది చీఫ్ ఫిజిషియన్ అట్ సిహెచ్యూవి టూ ఇయర్స్ లేటర్ హీ దెన్ టూ రెస్పాన్సిబిలిటీ ఫర్ ఆల్ దిడియాటిక్ న్యూరో సర్జరీ అట్ ద సిహెచ్యూవి Professor Daniel has extensive experience in the surgical treatment of benign skull tumors such as vestibular schwannomas, meningiomas, and pituitary adenomas. He is also a pioneer in pediatric epilepsy surgery. He has developed new intervention techniques based on hemispherical and subhemispherical disconnections. In the emerging field of realignment of cervico-occipital hinge, he has developed a surgical technique with the creation of new implants and instruments in collaboration with an American team. In addition, Professor Daniel has several ongoing clinical research projects in the field of skull base surgery and vascular neurosurgery, both at the Swiss and European level, as well as through international multi-center research projects. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker with us, and today he'll be talking about surgical management of clinoid and tuberculum cell meningiomas. The second speaker for today is our honored senior faculty from China, Professor Lin Yunhui. Professor Yun Hui is the Executive Vice President at the Shengjing Hospital of China Medical University. He is the Director of Neurosurgery Department, Second Level Professor, Doctoral Supervisor and Expert of Special Allowance from the State Council. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars and today he will be talking about Diagnosis and Management of Non-Pressure Hydrocephalus. The Chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Jordan, Professor Ibrahim Sabah. Professor Sabah is a Consultant Neurosurgeon at the Farah Healthcare Campus, Amman, Jordan. He adorned the position of the second vice president at large of the WFNS in the past. He is a member of the Skull Base Surgery Committee and Education Committee and International Initiative and Fundraising Committee of the WFNS. He decorated the chair of the past president of the Jordanian Neuroscience Society and Pan-Arab Neurosurgical Society. Professor Sibba is a passionate teacher and fulfills his commitments towards the young neurosurgeon by conducting the monthly, monthly Jordanian Grand Rounds, which is aired online. and is also an excellent resource for learning neurosurgery for the youngsters we are extremely honored to have him today to chair the session of professor roy thomas daniel the second chair for today is our honored guest from japan professor kiyoshi takagi professor takagi is a consultant neurosurgeon at the normal pressure hydrocephalus center abiko shinjikai hospital chiba prefecture japan professor takagi is an authority in the treatment of nph he has devoted his long decorated career in the development of new strategies in the diagnosis and management of nph he previously served as a director of the nph center at tokyo neurological center the chiba takashi tanaka hospital and nagareyama center hospital he is an extremely important member of the japanese neurosurgical society he has published several articles in various peer reviewed journals and he has also been an integral part of the acns delegation that conducts educational workshops all over asia we are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of today's webinar on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president of the yokato i would like to welcome both the chairs and speakers as well as the distinguished audiences to this online platform for acns webinars dr lyubun singh from malaysia is my co-host for today and with that introduction i would like to hand over this platform to professor ibrahim sabba just to, to say thank you for the invitation it's a great pleasure now to be with you today um currently practicing at the farah medical campus in amman jordan and it gives me great pleasure and honor to introduce to you professor roy thomas daniel as you mentioned raj this is a magnificent journey taking uh, roy from kerala to the christian medical college in velour to the royal hospital adelaide hospital adelaide in australia to the university hospital in lausanne switzerland where he's practicing now and as you mentioned it is areas of interest are skull base vascular neurosurgery pediatric neurosurgery especially epileptic uh, surgery or epilepsy surgery uh, a few years back the eans skull base section uh, asked the task force to look into certain topics and uh, leading those were professor boy daniel with lorenzo gematti vladimir penish sebastian frolic paolo cavallanca luigi cavallo and others were also participating like kenji ohata ataka fukushima 
Hussam al Mifti, Tatajib, and Shroder. So, this does task force were given the task of looking into certain issues, look into the literature and decide what is the uh, best approach for certain problems. And one of the, uh, of the results of this task force was the publication of a beautiful paper. One of them is on petroclival meningiomas, update of the current treatment and consensus by the ENS Calvary section, uh, Roy Daniels with his colleagues, and that was published in ACTA Neurosurgery March 2021. And another paper also published by the task force and the surgical management of tuberculum cell meningioma, myths, facts, and controversies, again by Roy Daniel and his colleagues, published in ACTA in December 2019. This confusion about tuberculum cell meningioma and the result of this confusion is people lumping all these tumors in the subracellular region as subracellular meningiomas. So these are not the same. This tumor is different from this, from this, from that. This is the crystal gallery, and this is the switcher between the frontal bone and the, desert, or the, the um, um, sphenoid bone. And then we're coming here to the uh, chiasmatic sulcus and then coming to the cella. So this is the tuberculum cell. There is an upper limbus and lower limbus of the uh, chiasm, and the origin of the tumor is from here. It's different from diaphragma cellae, it's different from others. So definitely these tumors are not the same. They look to be supracellular, but they are not the same. And when you look into literature, you don't know which of which. So you cannot come to conclusions once that is done. And that was the function of the task force headed by Roy to decide upon this. So this is, for example, is anterior climate meningiomas, different from supracellular meningiomas. Extension from this is phenocavernous meningioma to supracellular does not make it a supracellular tumor or a tuberculum cell meningioma. So we are gonna hear, and I'm sure Roy will give us all these points about the preoperative planning, about whether tuberculum cell meningioma better dealt with transcranial approach or endoscopic approach. And if we are dealing with a transcranial approach, which approach? Terrional, unilateral, frontal, bilateral, trans, uh, based, trans, uh, interhemispheric, and which side? Should we go the same side or the other side of the uh, bad vision or the uh, whether the patient is right-handed, left-handed? Should we be opening the optic canal before surgery, before we start or at the end of the surgery? And what about post-operative? Follow up. It's my great honor and pleasure to present to you Professor Roy Thomas Daniel. Roy, the microphone is yours. Ibrahim, for an, an excellent uh, introduction. It's as if you already saw my presentation, but I'm very happy that you uh, introduced the, the topic well. When we had uh, decided on talking on clinoid and tuberculum, I realized later on that it's a little bit too uh, ambitious. So. I think I'll stick to tuberculum cell to start with because we should generate some discussion. I'd like to hear from the other experts in the audience and in the panel. So let's stick to just tuberculum today because we have only 40 minutes to do that. Uh, with your permission, Dr. Ibrahim and Dr. Raja, uh, I'll just stick to tuberculum. And thank you, Dr. Raja and the organizers of the ACNS to invite me. Okay, so um, I have no disclosures, and uh, as uh, Professor Ibrahim said, uh, the, the region that we are talking about today is this, this line here, and that's the tuberculum. So you can find it just behind the chiasmatic sulcus and the planum sphenoidale, and behind that is the pituitary fossa and the dorsum cell. Luckily, you have the anterior clinoid processes uh, and then the middle fossa on either side. Now, this contains important structures, as you all know, the the chiasmatic sulcus and the, the optic nerves and the chiasm here, the pituitary here, the carotid artery. These are the major structures uh, that we will be dealing with. Uh, what's very important to realize is the dural attachment of these tumors and the blood supply from the different arteries. The majority of the blood supply comes from the posterior ethmoidal and branches of the ophthalmic artery. And then based on extensions, other arteries uh, can also be uh, 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 vascularizing the tumor. Uh, a lot of uh, knowledge uh, of the uh, anatomy has also come from the endonasal root, 
where, uh, as you can see in these cadaver dissections, especially to understand these fine vessels that uh, innervate the chiasma and the optic nerves. And these, these fine vessels ultimately uh, decide the prognosis uh, for vision because these patients present with visual problem. Even if you remove the whole tumor, but you uh, put at risk these fine vessels, uh, the vision can worsen or will not at least improve. And two groups of arteries have now been well uh, described. Uh, and this uh, one group, which is anterior to the infundibulum and one group posterior to the infundibulum. So these vessels have to be preserved in all cases from both sides. Uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the nomenclature of this tumor and uh, Dr. Ibrahim already uh, um, dealt with this issue, but uh, you have a wide range of tumors of the anterior fossa. So to start with, from most anterior, there are olfactory groove, and these tumors reach very large sizes before they become symptomatic. And then you have, as you go posterior, these tumors become smaller in size because they're present early. So from anterior to posterior, you have the olfactory groove, the planum, the tuberculum, and the diaphragm. And sometimes it's difficult to know where it started, but mostly we go by the rule that the midpoint of the tumor, and if it's tuberculum, then you call it tuberculum. And anything posterior is diaphragm, and anything anterior is either planum or olfactory. Uh, some of uh, some interesting concepts have come about how these uh, tumors grow, because they can grow in several directions. They can become asymmetric, they can go inferiorly, uh, they can go over the optic nerve. And essentially it's a function of the structures that dictate that. And so you have these arachnoid bands on either side, you have optic nerve and carotid on either side. So what happens is the, the main route for tumor spread is anteriorly over the planum and over the optic nerves and above the chiasm around the anterior communicating artery complex. So that's how these tumors usually tend to grow. Now we were looking as, as Dr. Ibrahim said, we, the ENS uh, skull base committee um, appointed a task force and uh, we were looking extensively at literature. Now all the images that you see in my presentation and all the videos are uh, taken as examples from our personal series from Switzerland. So very often you have, uh, when you look at literature, you will find a grouping of cases. So it's difficult to find uh, evidence from literature because very often these tumors are grouped together. So you have plain grouping of planum and tuberculum, and then you have others that group planum and olfactory or uh, tuberculum and diaphragm. Now, but these tumors are often taken together, but does it really matter? Yes, it matters to some respect. The approach is almost always the same, but it, uh, recognizing it, uh, will uh, uh, lead us to do the correct kind of um, techniques during surgery, which I'll be touching on in my presentation with examples from our series. Essentially, this if, if you do the correct approach, you can have a very good result. And this is a patient five years after surgery. There's hardly any frontal lobe damage. Patients do very well if the surgery uh, follows the principles of skull-based surgery. Now, over the years, there have been many gradings of uh, tuberculum cell meningiomas. So you see uh, Yazid's grading, which is essentially a grading based on size. And then people started realizing it's not just the size, there are other things. This is Atul Goel's uh, important article that looks at all clinical factors, looks at radiological parameters, and then made a grading scale. Now, these, these can be very uh, difficult to implement because there are many things to look at, but I would uh, I would sincerely urge all surgeons uh, dealing with these tumors to look at all these points uh, carefully because it's worth it. Uh, there was a later present uh, grading system by uh, uh, Shaker and colleagues where they went into a little more detail. They started looking at optic canal invasion, vascular invasion, brain invasion on MR, as you can see here. Some patients have extensive edema on both sides whether there was previous surgery and radiation. So based on the, these are the factors that we have to look for before deciding on how we're going to operate this, uh, these cases. So we, before this, the task force did that, we had published a, a series of about five years, uh, seven years actually. It's a small number of patients, but uh, we looked uh, very attentively using all these anatomical factors. So it's, many of them were class one and two, and some of them were uh, class three. But all of them, a large group of them presented with uh, 
with visual deficits. So that's usually the key. Uh, Tuberculum cell A and planum sphenoidal and diaphragma cell A tumors almost often have visual problems. So just to go through quickly through some videos, you could see this patient who presented with uh, visual problems on both sides. You can see the field deficits here. We always do a very front, very basal frontal basal craniotomy, frontotemporal basal craniotomy. And that immediately takes you to the cisterns and gives you cisternal decompression. And then the tumor is actually becomes very superficial in a way. So there's no need for extensive uh, sylvian opening to access these tumors as long as the craniotomy is very basic. So there you can see the carotid and the ipsilateral optic nerve. And then the principles of uh, any skull-based meningioma surgery is to identify the arachnoid very well. And you can see how arachnoidal peeling is done. I never ever coagulate the arachnoid because that's a, a very bad move. And you can lose the plane and injure all the uh, small vessels or nerves that are uh, attached, uh, that are in relation to the tumor. So the principles of surgery is usually you debulk the tumor, find the arachnoidal plane and work around it, keep decompressing till it becomes small enough, dissect all around, uh, remove the bulk of the tumor before you go on to the smaller parts of the tumor onto the other side or the posterior side onto the infundibulum. So there you see the tumor coming off once we're sure that the arachnoid plane is uh, completely uh, removed. So the arachnoid stays with the patient. And then immediately you can see the optic nerve on the other side and you get your first glimpse of the pituitary stalk here. And then you can see progressively the, the optic nerve. Uh, if you move the microscope a bit, you can see the optic nerve and the carotid on the other side. So this is a fantastic view of the carotid and the ophthalmic artery on the other side. And that's essentially the surgery that gives you very good results. Uh, this is at uh, three years follow-up. Uh, the visual deficit usually improves as you can see here. And the endocrine function in most cases is preserved. Another uh, uh, case, just to show you some examples. This is a tumor that's going a slightly more posteriorly. And there again, frontal lobe here, temporal lobe here, you do a very basal craniotomy and you do a very basal durotomy. So you can see the brain is not very uh, tense because the arachnoid planes are being opened into the cisterns. And as you keep decompressing the CSF, it gives you all the space. So you don't need any brain retraction finally, because these tumors are never massive. Even if they're massive, the arachnoidal opening of the cisterns, adjacent cisterns will give you enough decompressions to be, uh, to allow you to reach there. Now the main uh, uh, challenge in these cases is the ipsilateral optic nerve. And that I'll be dealing with that in more uh, detail later. And uh, because there is, there is manipulation of the ipsilateral optic nerve. And a lot of structures will be hidden by the optic nerve, including tumor in, and the stock, which will always be under this. And there you have the carotid, ipsilateral carotid, uh, and uh, the, ar the arachnoid has to be kept. And there you can see the tumor that's in the space between the, uh, between the carotid and the optic nerve. Now this manipulation of the optic nerve is unavoidable in the surgery. And that's why uh, the opening of the clinoidectomy, which I'll be showing later, the clinoidectomy and the optic foraminotomy allows you to decompress the optic nerve and to move it uh, uh, so that you access the tumor that's hidden by the ipsilateral optic nerve. And eventually you will have to work on both sides of the optic nerve to be able to remove the tumor that is hidden by the optic nerve. The key of course is to keep the arachnoid intact and do not ever, uh, I never coagulate the arachnoid and lose the plane. And then you go across, you can see the, the opposite side optic nerve, which is very easy to see actually. And as you keep uh, decompressing the tumor, uh, more and more of the extra tumoral space gets exposed. The difficult part is the part which is most closest to the surgeon, which is under the optic nerve. So there is a, a bit of manipulation of the optic nerve, but because it is being liberated in the uh, optic canal and the falciform ligament, which is open, it, uh, it tolerates that. Uh, the challenge, of course, is... Uh, to removing the tumor is not that much of a problem, but the, the attachment, if there is a tumor attachment to the optic foramen dura, that becomes uh, 
almost impossible to remove. And even if you try to remove that dura, you may compromise the vascularity to the nerve. So this is the lady who came with visual loss on uh, both sides actually, and it had an excellent outcome. So let's look at the outcome of the whole series. If you look at gross total resection rates is over 90% in, in, the, in the simpler tumors and the complex tumors. Visual improvement is very high in these tumors. We had no visual deterioration, no major morbidity or mortality. One patient had a partial anti anterior hypopituitarism. Two of them developed uh, anosmia and one had a fourth nerve palsy. Uh, one patient had a recurrence which needed a surgery to, by a contralateral approach. And the need for post-operative radiosurgery in the series of 27 patients, uh, had there was only one patient who needed radio surgery for a small residue. So those are the results that are possible. Now this presentation is, the, is organized in a way in which is asking questions. So that we ask some certain questions across the task force and uh, through review of literature, whether endocrine function needs to be studied systematically. So we looked at literature. There are papers that say there is no pre or post-operative dysfunction, but there are others that say that you could have it. Uh, the results are inhomogeneous, but that's essentially, that depends on your series. If you have a lot of diaphragmous cellular meningiomas, then it's very difficult to have patients with no endocrine dysfunction pre or post. So there will always be a few patients who will have some, some problems because significant dissection of the infundibulum is almost always necessary. So we prefer to perform routine endocrine examinations in all our patients before and after surgery. Now we come to the important question, unilateral or bilateral cranial. So tyrional surgery has been described very uh, many, many decades ago, but then a lot of uh, groups have proposed the interhemispheric approach and bilateral approaches. So they were popular for a bit, but if you look at modern literature, the majority of uh, series published, even those that published comparisons, uh, comment on the fact that the frontolateral approach uh, provide the best results with, uh, uh, with uh, these meningiomas. But essentially, it's a surgeon choice so, because you can have good results with all transcranial approach. So that surgeon preference is a key, but modern literature and our personal experience is that uh, the unilateral approach is uh, by far the better. Uh, now, if we say that we need to do a unilateral approach, there are groups who say, always do a non-dominant hemisphere. Why risk the vascularity to the dominant hemisphere? Uh, in modern neurosurgical terms, is that much of a concern? I don't believe so because there are other things that are more important because the chances of producing an internal carotid problem with this surgery, I've never seen it and it's so, so, so rare in modern microsurgery. So dominant hemisphere theory does not really hold in my opinion. So if you are doing a unilateral approach, which uh, approach uh, would you do if you disregard the dominance of the hemisphere? One of the important things to realize is look at this patient with an olfactory groove and you see this tumor here, there's edema in this lobe and this lobe is okay. You can see that the fox is pushed to the other side and uh, this is regular olfactory groove with meningioma. You do a frontoorbital craniotomy in olfactory groove to give you better access uh, uh, to the tumor. I'm not going to go too much into olfactory group. And that's the fox which needs to be cut to give access to the contralateral side. Uh, but these are standard uh, techniques. So I'm not going to deal with that today. And these are the results that are possible with the huge tumor. You can see that the frontal lobe is hardly untouched on both sides. And the key I wanted to show here is that the fact that the vessels are pushed to the other side and the fox is pushed to the other side. It means, and it's producing edema on, only on one side, it's always better to go on the side of this, uh, this side because there, is, uh, the, there are two layers of PR protecting the other side and it's better to deal with this frontal lobe than the opposite side. So pay attention to these hyperintensities in vein and shift of A2 vessels in these uh, situations. Uh, if, uh, if it's a tuberculum meningioma, then we need to look at the, the visual situation because almost all of them come with vision. Now, one of the, now here opinion is divided, uh, let's say 50-50 here. 
from my discussions with uh, many, many uh, skull based surgeons worldwide. A lot of people say it's better to go on the side of the worst vision. Now look at this lady who came with 55 years male visual loss on the left side. You can see that the tumor is preferentially going to the optic foramen on the left side. So, uh, and that's a result that's possible with the surgery uh, on th this side because you can go aggressively and de uh, decompress the nerve on this side, go into the optic foramen and remove the whole thing. Uh, so if you look at uh, uh, the literature, there are a lot of people who, who essentially propose uh, the unilateral craniotomy on the side of the worst vision. The main uh, idea is to preserve the non-compromised optic nerve. As you can see, if you, if you operate from the side of the good vision, that good nerve is always in view and you have to go around it to get to the other side. And if you have some accident with that nerve, then you have... Uh, compromised nerve on the other side due to the tumor and a compromised the surgeon compromised nerve on this side. So that's a big risk to take in my view. So probably it's better to go on the side of the worst vision. But that's not always the case. And a lot of surgeons go from the other side. And I'll show you examples why it should be from the other side in some certain cases. Now, this is a patient that we operated some time back for again following the same principles to go from the side of the worst vision. But then Patient came seven years later with a small residue, growing residue on the contralateral side because we did not have access uh, on that side from the uh, side of the worst vision, the first surgery. So there you have a small tumor. So this time we decided to go with a contralateral approach and you can see it's so easy to see that and open the optic foramen from inside intradurally. And that is a very easy surgery because it's a small tumor. So. Small tumors like this situated medially against the optic nerve and going into the canal, you have an excellent vision from the contralateral side. So you have to have both these uh, options with you all the time and, and uh, based on your personal preference and the patient's uh, uh, presentation, you can decide which side to go on. The main uh, pros for this approach is you get a direct view of the inframedial part of the compromised optic nerve which is a blind area during the ipsilateral approach. And there, of course, there's less manipulation of the compromised optic nerve during the dissection of tumors. The, the, the against for this is that you, you can, when you, the, this is the nerve in view, so you should not damage this nerve. But if you're going for a small tumor, it's not that much of a problem. I don't think it's, uh, you will damage it uh, on your way into that tumor. Now, pneumosinus dilatans is one important consideration that needs to be done. You can see this, uh, the sinuses in many of these cases becoming larger in size. So this condition can have implications for surgery, especially for endoscopic surgery. So this is a study from uh, Bill Caldwell's uh, group where they looked at the normal anatomy here and you have a type A when the dilatation is just anterior to the pituitary. And then you have more dilatation, which goes all the way across. And as the intensity increases and the tumor, uh, uh, the tumor location is the key, of course. When you have tumors that bypass this and go to the, the other side of the dilatation or even go into the behind retroclival region, these cases are very, very bad for uh, endonasal approaches. Now, for these cases, the small one where it is accessible anterior to the pituitary endonasal is a possibility, not that you have to do it. I personally don't do it. Yeah. And for all three conditions, the transcranial alternative is possible as you will see in the rest of the presentation. Now, pneumatization of the uh, tuberculum cellae, this can have important uh, implications. So this was a recent case that we did. You can see that the, the tumor is all, this is actually a diaphragma cellae tumor. It's entirely uh, at the tuberculum and behind and there's a large uh, pneumatization. And if you can see the CT properly, you will find that uh, it's all around, the pneumatization is all around the optic nerve. So this uh, needs to be clearly understood before surgery so that you can plan your surgery. And I'll show you a quick video of that. So what we did in this case is to do a, a sphenoidal, that's the orbit here. So you did a, a, a part of the orbitotomy is done here. And there you, as soon as you do that, you see the mucus of the ethmoid sinus because it's completely pneumatized as, as if you remember the CT scan. So basically what we are doing here is to remove the planum from, from inside. 
and when you remove the plenum from inside, you keep exposing the, the mucosa of the uh, ethmoid sinus. You keep opening it. And don't forget that as we go along, you'll find a free floating, not really floating, but you'll find the optic nerve inside covered by bone, but it's, there is a sinus all around it. So that's your first vision of the optic nerve. And then as you keep drilling, you will find uh, sinus on air sinus on both sides. And then you open the entire uh, optic foramen for about 180 degrees. Now, this is essential in most of these cases of uh, tuberculum and surely for diaphragm because the optic nerve manipulation uh, is not possible without a problem if you don't uh, do an optic nerve decompression uh, before doing tumor manipulation. So that's the, uh, the or, or optic foramen optic. And then you keep removing the planum on both sides of the optic foramen. Uh, and then the tuberculum, you reach virtually the tuberculum. So the more bone you remove, the more axis you get extra duty. So that's your nerve uh, uh, here. And then you can see that, uh, that uh, the bony removal gives you so much space to work uh, uh, as when you open the dura you will see how, how much of a difference it, it will make so that's inside there if you go this is the sylvian fissure here and then immediately you're on the tumor and then you will see the the optic nerve here you can see and then you can see the tumor and you will have to take it from both sides of the optic nerve obviously but you it wouldn't even be visible if you hadn't done all that planar removal and there you got a quick view of the contralateral optic nerve. As you keep removing the tumor, you'll see more and more of the contralateral optic nerve. And there, and when you remove that, you'll see the third nerve in the distance there. And as the tumor is being debulked and progressively dissected and removed, uh, you will see the, uh, you, so that, that's the dural attachment onto the diaphragm, which is being coagulated now. You, it's very risky to try to remove that dura. But anyway, so that is the, the basilar trunk and the branches there. Uh, and then, of course, you have to do a very uh, good uh, plasty of the skull base. So that's the repair of the planum dura with fat and some um, glue. And then you can see the optic nerve extra durally there. And that needs to be completely uh, put with fat and seal so that there is no CSF problems. So this is an important part when you do a planum removal from inside. So that needs to have a careful attention. So this is the post-op image. If you can see that is pre-op here. This is the planum removal that was done during surgery. And that is the optic nerve here. But what you see around it is the fat which we have put. So this is the pre-op uh, image and you can see a uh, total excision and the infundibulum there. Now this here, there is something against the optic nerve, but that is fat. Right, so before we decide on surgery, the bony anatomy has uh, serious implications for surgery because the anatomy is quite variable. So there are a few criteria that need to be looked at. You need to look at the interoptic distance that allows you to find out if it is narrow or wide. So the, are the optic nerves separate and is the chiasm a very wide one? Then you look, need to look at planum length, the sulcal length and the sulcal angle. So this is the sulcal angle. So the angle between the planum and as you go down over the chiasmatic uh, sulcus. So this will give you the sulcal angle. So that will decide on whether it is steep or, uh, or uh, narrow. So these are important considerations that need to be measured and done for you to predict how you will uh, approach the tumor and how much of bony removal of the tuberculum and the planum you may have to do if necessary. So is, uh, this is another important point that came up in our discussions within the task force is, uh, is a large sylvan fissure opening always necessary? Now older surgeons and especially vascular surgeons they are always very comfortable with a large sylvian fissure opening. But is that really essential for skull base surgery was the question. So this is uh, one group which, this, these are older uh, studies, which said that it should always be open widely and uh, from the distal to proximal direction. And then these are the results with visual improvement. Yes, but there were visual aggravations, there were cerebral infarctions, 
Uh, on the other hand, you have the modern series that uh, have come out, many of them, which uses no major Sylvian opening, but uses a skull-based approach, which gives no visual aggravation, like seen in our series and Shaker series here, with the uh, visual improvement in the majority of patients. So my feeling is, uh, and our task force, task force agreed, that uh, it's not always necessary because the outcomes are better with skull-based uh, approaches. Now comes a little more difficult topic is whether the optic canal needs to be opened or not. Now look at these studies. They showed favorable visual outcome at uh, 80%, but they said that the routine uh, uh, optic canal decompression is to be reserved for extensive optic canal extensions of tumor. So uh, uh, they do it, but not for everybody. Uh, again, you have favorable results, but uh, in this series, uh, in a group that does skull-based surgery, skull-based approaches, where an extradural optic canal uh, they felt was not always uh, necessary. On the other hand, uh, many modern series talk about uh, doing an optic canal opening in all cases. And uh, the results apparently are better, but it's impossible to compare between groups, uh, between series, because it's quite inhomogeneous. Uh, so generally for this question, uh, the, I, uh, our policy is to open and most of the task members uh, agreed to that. Now, how do you open it? Do you do an extradural planodectomy or you do it intradural? There was no agreement on this. But the major advantage is that it rapidly relieves the compression of the optic nerve. It, it improves the ischemia. And when you manipulate the tumor, uh, you, cannot, you do not produce a problem due to the uh, displacement of the optic nerve. Now, do you do it before or after tumor debulking? Again, the, the, the results are uh, in from literature, you can't really say because this, some people say you can do it before or done later. But my feeling is, and most people agreed with us, is that it should be done before tumor de debulking because it makes more sense to do that, that way. Uh, we come to another contentious issue, which is the, which is the extended endonasal approach for these tumors. A lot of uh, studies have been done from very important centers like, uh, uh, like Pittsburgh or, or from Capabianca's group in uh, Naples, uh, Theodore Schwartz here, which uh, talk about in an appropriately selected group of patients, they claim to have better visual outcomes and lower rates of brain trauma and seizures. But that is just one opinion. Now you look at uh, where endoscopic versus open transcranial resection of anterior midline uh, tumors. They, this is again Schwartz publication, but there is a difference. This is not a very homogeneous comparison. The best comparison that uh, we could find, uh, I'll show you soon, but there are some indications where you, you could have uh, an advantage of doing that. And this is one of our cases. Now, this was a patient who presented with meningomatosis and uh, we had earlier done a tuberculum cell excision uh, from planum and tuberculum. And then many years later, he came with the infradiaphragmatic uh, recurrence. So an infradiaphragmatic recurrence is an excellent indication for an endonasal approach. As you can see here, that's the tumor through the nose. And there you can see uh, the, the diaphragm uh, that you need to excise and open. See, that's a diaphragm being pulled down and that's supradiaphragmatic. And there's absolutely no tumor in the supradiaphragmatic space, because that's the region where the tumor was operated through a uh, transcranial route. And so a progressive removal of the diaphragm and, uh, and the tumor gives you excellent results, as you can see here. So there are some indications where it is absolutely indicated. But uh, do you do it for the first presentation for a supradiaphragmatic uh, is debatable. Uh, and this uh, Gentili's uh, uh, group here, which talked about the limits, they looked at uh, the limits of endonasal and found that if you have tumor extensions lateral to the IC and optic nerve, uh, the dissection is very difficult with vessel encasement. And of course, you have the problem with skull base repair. So these are the limitations. But don't also, uh, another important thing which many people don't talk about is that uh, there is significant decrease in nasal quality of life after endoscopic meningioma surgery. So that is a often ignored part of uh, the endonasal uh, treatment of meningiomas. There's one uh, good study that is probably less biased than most other studies, 
uh, led by uh, Michael McDermott, which compared two groups known for one group known for transcranial UCSF, another group from Naples, uh, uh, Capabianca's group known for endonasal surgery, and they looked at the tumor characteristics of these groups. And the results they found were the tumors treated by the transcranial route had uh, more difficult cases uh, based on the grading scale. Uh, and however, uh, there was no difference in overall complication rates between the two. Uh, but of course, the transphenoidal approach had more CSF leads. The recurrence rate was 10%. There was no difference. So there's essentially, you, you end up with an idea that difficult tumors are almost always done by transcranial. So, but then in that situation, why do you want to make a surgery difficult by not doing it transcranially and doing it endonasal is a question that needs to be answered by all surgeons who deal with it. So one of the uh, things that I wanted to talk about uh, in a pointed manner for is for diaphragma cellae specifically, because diaphragma cellae meningioma uh, is a different ball game because it's completely behind the tuberculum. And this is a video that we had published some time back for diaphragm SLA, uh, the, the subfacial dissection of the temporalis muscle to get you basal there uh, for uh, this move along there. So unroofing of the superior orbital fissure that needs to be done. Then unroofing that's foramen rotundum to get you one end of the superior orbital fissure. And then of course the 180 decompression of the optic canal is a key for all these cases, especially for diaphragm. And then that is the falciform ligament, which is then subsequently open. Now the key steps for meningioma removal, I think uh, we've dealt with, but a basal durotomy and immediately you are at the skull base with no major brain retraction. Olfactory nerve here, and that leads you to the optic nerve. The cisterns are there, you open them. And then you see the ipsilateral optic nerve. And once you see the ipsilateral optic nerve and the carotid, then you will start seeing the tumor on either side of the optic nerve. Now, fortunately, the diaphragma cellular meningiomas are usually smaller tumor because they're present early. And there you can see a glimpse of the contralateral nerve and it needs to be approached from both sides of the optic nerve. And that's the value of doing a complete decompression, 180 degrees of the optic nerve allows you to move that. And there you see the pituitary stalk. You can't use much coagulation in this region because that will take you take off the vascularity to these important structures. So just identify the arachnoid, decompress, and slowly remove the tumor. The only uh, coagulation is used as the implantation base, and that needs to be carefully done and make sure the heat does not spread to uh, the optic nerves or the uh, infundibular, uh, the stock of the pituitary. So once the tumor comes out, you'll see the stock very well there, the optic nerve, and then you will see the basilar artery, the perforators, and the contralateral third nerve. So, so that's essentials of diaphragm cellular meningioma surgery. Now, one important, and this I think is the last point that I'll be discussing, is the ophthalmic artery in, um, in tuberculum cellular and the surgical implications of that. Now, this is a recent case that we did, uh, tuberculum cellar that has some attachment onto the diaphragm as well. Look at here uh, the position of the, and here the position of the uh, uh, ophthalmic artery. So, and this is a man who came with no visual deficits. And this is the space that I think we need to look for all cases. Now, this is the optico-ophthalmic space that has been created by the tumor. So that's an important consideration that needs to be taken. I'll show a quick video of this. Now, most of the tumor has been removed, but this is just to show you what happens to the ophthalmic artery. Because if you remember the image, there was tumor all around the ophthalmic artery. So we have not just the carotid uh, uh, to look for, we need also the ophthalmic artery that needs to be taken care of. Now, as we, this is the ipsilateral optic nerve, that's the contralateral optic nerve. And there you see the glimpse of the, uh, the ophthalmic artery. Now, you can only coagulate the basal attachments. Now, around the ophthalmic artery, you cannot coagulate. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, so that's your ophthalmic artery that uh, is being, being progressively dissected. And uh, you can see it as we go along. We stopped using the bipolar and started doing it just with dissectors and forceps. 
Now, as you keep following the ophthalmic artery, you'll end up with the contralateral uh, carotid. And so that's your contralateral carotid that will be seen there. And after that, you will remove, you can remove that piece. And then you see the part of the tumor on the other side of the ophthalmic artery. And this is the space I was talking about, the uh, optico-ophthalmic space, which has been created by uh, uh, encircling of the tumor around the ophthalmic artery. Now that's a lot more difficult to remove because these are very high zoom and small structures and there's no way you can control bleeding uh, because you can't really use the, uh, the bipolar there. And if you do, you lose the vessels that go to the optical. So you'd have to be patient about it. Uh, remove the tumor in this space, the optical ophthalmic space. Uh, you will get some bleeding if there is attachment onto the optic, uh, the dura of the optic foramen. But even if it is there, you'll just have to be, you have to get hemostasis by compression. I don't think you can put in a bipolar there to coagulate it because you will certainly lose the vascularity to this now. So you keep uh, patiently uh, removing the arachnoidal adherences. This is the carotid artery on the contralateral side and the ophthalmic artery origin. And then you will see the, the tumor encircling on the other side. And that has to be removed uh, patiently after dissecting of the arachnoid bands uh, without bipolar. And there you can see, it, it's very difficult if the tumor is firm, but if it's a softer tumor, the life becomes a little more easier in, in this particular situation. And you have to go on either side of the ophthalmic artery to be able to remove it. You can see some of the dura, which is hypervascular on the other side, but you can't do much about it. One of the things you can do about it, I'll show you shortly. Once the tumor comes out and you have a reasonable hemostasis, what we do is to do a kind of uh, pexy of the chiasmopexy or, or uh, optico, optic nerve pexy with fat. So you will put fat on the contralateral nerve between the ophthalmic artery and the optic nerve. The reason we do this is that we know that there is attachment, tumor attachment that has not been treated. Uh, I mean, dura with the residual tumor attachment of the optic foramen, and that cannot be coagulated. So if there is a recurrence in the future and we have want to give radiosurgery, then this fat could give us some level of protection. So that's one strategy that we use. Now, this is the post-op image of this patient. You can see the tumor is completely removed. And that you see is the chiasmopexy that we have performed on the contralateral side in the sagittal and in the corona. This patient had transient hypocortisolism for two weeks. So three months follow-up, we had normal vision and normal endocrine function. And the MRI till now is showing uh, no recurrence or residual tumor. So in conclusion, I'd like to state that the choice of approaches uh, depends on surgeon experience and preference. You saw all the possibilities that we have discussed. But the key is to carefully analyze the visual status and the CT and MR features so that you can deal with all the small uh, uh, points that I raised in my presentation. Now with the frontobasal, uh, skull base, transcranial approach, with the clinoidectomy, uh, excellent outcomes can be achieved both for visual and endocrine function with very minimal morbidity, at least as felt uh, evidenced by our CTs. Uh, so the many, most of the things that you saw in this presentations have been summarized in this uh, article that came out in ACTA a couple of years back, where we discussed point by point uh, in our committee these uh, several issues. I thank you all for a patient listening. I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that you have or any comments from the panel or the, or the attendees. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. It's, um, thank you for this very comprehensive outlay of the topics that we uh, uh, you will uh, discuss now. Uh, there are points that you mentioned, and I'd like to go through them and ask the audience if they agree or disagree with it. Uh, you told us that microsurgery is better in general than endonasal uh, surgery. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely, for this tumor, yes. Except, tumor. except in the soul, uh, when you have a totally infradiaphragmatic tumor. 
Sure. If it is supradiaphragmatic, which represents 99% of tumors, uh, then I think the transcranial root has, uh, has an excellent uh, outcome. Now, I come from a center where both roots, we do extensive work on both sides of the diaphragm, both endonasal and uh, transcranial. Now, if, you, if you're working in a center which has a lot of experience in one and not much in the other, then it's better to go with the ones that you have a lot of experience with. Now, in our center, we do 50-50. So we have experience in both. And when I compare both, I think the transcranial for this pathology is better. Thank you. May I ask any of the audience who want to agree or disagree with this concept? Obviously, they are in agreement that micro neurosurgery for this kind of a tumor has the upper hand on the endonasal, especially with large tumors with the lateral extension and so on. The second point that you mentioned that unilateral approach is better than bilateral approach. I may disagree on that because there is always the blind spot with the unilateral approach that you don't see the wayside of the ipsilateral optic nerve. So I like to see both inner surfaces of the nerves and the chaos when I can deal with these things. I don't know that anybody disagree with this or agree with this, unilateral or bilateral. Well, then when we had Professor Kenji Ohata with us, who described the surgery of tuberculum cilium in Jumas before, and he compared both unilateral and bilateral approaches. And the thing that he found most useful was olfaction was better preserved when you do a bilateral approach. Because in unilateral, you have to retract the lobe farther to see the contralateral side. That is one reason he gave to choose a bifrontal approach rather than a unilateral approach. What do you say, Professor Roy Thomas Daniel? Have you had any problems with olfaction due to extensive retraction in your series? Yes, uh, I showed that in my presentation. We had two patients who had hyposmia in a series of 27. Yes, uh, hyposmia can occur, but I don't know if it is less if you do bilateral. Uh, the problem is not just uh, olfaction with bilateral. I think the problem is also that you have a longer trajectory to the tumor because the frontal lobe medially is much longer than the frontal lobe laterally. And the fact that you're dealing with both frontal lobes which need to be mobilized to reach there. These are the things that for which most surgeons, I think, prefer the unilateral approach because you're dealing with just one frontal lobe and the distance is shorter. But it essentially depends on surgeon preference. You know? So you can't be too dogmatic about these things, I think. The other point is uh, you mentioned about optic canal, the roofing or opening of the optic canal. Should that be done early or late? And you are recommending that this should be done early, correct? Yes, absolutely. So early in the procedure, you do the decompression and then you rest assured that you are seeing the optic nerve, you can manipulate it and so on. Yes, Anybody part, disagree part with this? It's part of the craniotomy. Sure. Anybody disagree with this or agree? Yes, Liu, would you like to comment? Uh, as as uh, what I came, came across the literature, uh, like a profile mentioning if, if uh, the tumor does compress on the optic nerve, uh, especially the hidden area that we, we cannot uh, exercise uh, uh, safely. We, we have better visual outcome. Uh, that's based on my readings. Actually, I, I have a few questions for Professor Roy, probably after Professor Ibrahim uh, uh, question. Prof, thanks. Surely. The case that you showed us with the anterior clinoid being created, right? Yes, and yes. the optic nerve was just lying in the sinus. As we all know that the anterior clinoid gets irradiated through the strut, the optic strut. So is it enough just to put the fat intracranially? Do you need to take out the struts and you put fat inside the hole of the irradiated anterior clinoid? Yeah, but, but anywhere you can access the aerated uh, region is enough. Here we concentrated more to the planum, so I did not remove the entire anterior clinoid and the strut. It was anyway completely aerated. So you need only one place and you can orient your microscope and push the fat in all directions. Right. May, uh, may, the last I, point about, add on, may I please add on to that uh, when Professor Daniel said to put the pad of fat graft there. When this series of uh, paraclinoid aneurysms came out from Sapporo, 
and they had few patients where they have post up they they had post operative visual decline following clinoidectomy and in that series they found that the uh, when they inserted the fat around the optic nerves this was the patients who were more likely to have a visual decline following clinoidectomy so have you found in your any series where you had a visual decline and which correlated with the placement of fat in that region no not really i don't think it is related to fat placement uh, clinoidectomy and visual deterioration is known to occur and I, my feeling is it is because of the heat of the the drill so if you put a lot of water and you're very careful and you it's like drilling uh, in a swimming pool it should be done like that because the fat uh, the the heat of the drill is what uh, reduces the vascularization or uh, it's a thermal injury of the nerve Uh, and i don't really believe that it is due to fat and placement uh, the, we did not have any visual deterioration in our series so i can't really tell you um, but we put fat for so many patients and i have not had a visual problem related to that i've had problems with that but that's unrelated to fat and i think i believe it is because uh, because of the for other cases not in this series but i've seen it before for sphena orbital and i think i believe it is due to the thermal injury of the uh, of the drilling of the clinoid thank you uh, roy one question i i'm sure it is on the minds of so many in the audience uh, there is a trend recently in uh, people going up front to take part of the tumor and then continue the treatment with the radio surgery they're doing this with the vestibular schwannomas they just debulk from inside and then give radio surgery and they are doing this with the supracellular tumors with tuberculum cell meningioma they just debulk and then give radio surgery i'm against that totally what what are your views about that oh well that's uh, nonsense that approach in my view i think these are tumors essentially uh, cannot be treated by radio surgery because they're so close to the optic nerve and these are the true tumors that will stay with neurosurgeons of oh, operative neurosurgeons many other meningiomas away from the optic nerve yes radio surgery is an alternative but this is the one group of tumors that radio surgery is never an alternative and therefore debulking and treatment does not really make any sense in my view so you should remove everything uh, as possible but then reaching uh, simpson 1 in tuberculum cellae is not always possible because the dura can stay so it's very often simpson 2 now the dura that uh, dural attachment the what do we do with it we burn it uh, but you can only burn the parts of the dura you remove a lot of it which is accessible but the one that goes to the diaphragm and the one that goes to the optic nerve may be a optic foramen may be a problem even to coagulate so at that point i would put a little bit of fat there and follow up this patient for many years and if i find some tumor coming somewhere on the clivus uh, at the limits of the tumor then at least you have fat that protects you protects the chiasma from the radio surgery i just want to add this point that since uh, laxel invented the gamma knife which is an excellent tool it is a very good tool the armamentarium of the neurosurgeon but there has been abuse of this beautiful technology that mediocre surgeons who cannot do the surgery would actually go and do this take bulk of the tumor the bulk from inside and give radio surgery be it supracellular we not doing many tumors vestibular schwannoma etc we have to speak to those people strongly and say stop it because this is not medicine this is not surgery you are abusing a beautiful tool which is the radio surgery yeah i completely agree thank you raj i uh, yeah. i think uh, there are some questions to ask you? a few questions Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Raja. Yeah, sure. Uh, 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 thanks, Prof. Roy. Uh, the only conclusion that I, I read is uh, for trans uh, endonasal uh, and uh, approach is only when there's a prefix chiasma, a, a stiff, stiff uh, sulcus, and cella type of a typical cella meningioma. Otherwise, all should be transcranial, whether you agree to it or not. My second question, Professor. uh you you do you have any tips because the the, the location of chiasma becomes so important do you have any tips that by imaging or by the progression of the loss of visual field can we predict whether it's prefix or postfix uh, chiasma 
uh, my, my third question, Professor, now, nowadays we do a lot of a contralateral approach because we want to reduce brain retraction. So what is your logic going towards the area that a lot of edema? My last question, Professor, why do you think there's no such thing as chiasmatic groove meningioma? Thank you, Professor. Wow, uh, there's a lot of questions. Okay, so for transcranial surgery, in my view, there are no limitations. So whether it is prefixed or postfixed, it doesn't matter to us. Prefixed and postfixed is an issue in endonasal surgery. Uh, and in transcranial surgery, it is not a limitation at all. I agree with you. We should look at it uh, on the imaging before to find out if it is pre or post. But it doesn't really matter. The approach is always the same. We need to know where the chiasma is and we need to identify it. Uh, your other question is that what is a chiasmatic meningioma? Is that what you said? Yeah. Well, why there's no chiasmatic group meningioma? Well, uh, well uh, it has to be a very small meningioma to be restricted to the chiasmatic group. But uh, if something is restricted only to the chiasmatic group, we are talking about three millimeter attachment. So that patient has to come to you at a three millimeter tumor. Now, three millimeter tumors rarely produce visual decompression, uh, visual compression. Maybe that's why there is no chiasmatic. Thank you, Professor. Thank Did you. I answer all your questions or is there any? Uh, the uh, edema, Prof, the contralateral approach. Brain yes, edema. Uh, the contralateral, uh, I didn't get the question on the contralateral yeah. approach. You, you show a, a, a case that you come in from the more edema side, but nowadays a lot of uh, contralateral approach that come from the normal side. So what's your opinion regarding this? Less but, brain retraction. Yeah, I personally prefer to come from the side of the worst vision because uh, you're always working with the optic nerve in your view. And I would rather work with the compromised optic nerve than to have a normal nerve. That is my personal view, except for this patient that I showed the last video where there was tumor in the optico-ophthalmic space. And that would have been impossible to see if I had done it from the ipsilateral side. So when there is extensive, when the ophthalmic artery is completely 360 degrees covered by tumor, I think it is better approach from the contralateral side. Apart from that, I would always approach from the side of the worst vision. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. We can go back to our chair and conclude this session. Professor Ibrahim Sabah, your concluding remarks. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, all the participants. Uh, it was lovely. Uh, session. I enjoyed it very much. And I give the microphone back to you, Raj, to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Saba and Professor uh, Thomas Daniel. It was a really wonderful and informative section. You gave us a, gave us a pictorial uh, graph of your entire article of the ENS skull-based task force. Thank you very much. Uh, may I inquire if you'd be staying back for the second lecture? Uh, possibly uh -huh. not few other things. I'm on call today. I have a few other things to do. Right. In that case, thank you very much. We're looking forward to see you another time in better times, of course. Thank you so much. In that case, we can move on to the second session. I would like to invite Professor Kiyoshi Takagi to say a short introduction. Professor Takagi. Hello. Uh, good morning. Good evening. <laughs> good night. Uh, you can hear me. I'll make short uh, uh, introductory part for normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, the concept of normal pressure hydrocephalus has been introduced by Hakim and Adams in 1965. It is characterized by dementia, gait disturbance, and urinary incontinence. Dilatation of the ventricular system is easy to identify on brain CT or MRI scan. The signs and symptoms can be treated by cerebrospinal fluid shunt surgery. So therefore, it is known as treatable dementia. And there are two types of NPH, secondary and idiopathic. Secondary NPH is easy to diagnose it uh, since there are preceding diseases such as subarachnoid hemorrhage or meningitis. However, idiopathic, even the guidelines for diagnosis and management is available. Many idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus patients are still overlooked. And uh, since INPH prevails only in elderly people, 
and the aging speed is very rapid. The importance of uh, INPH diagnosis is increasing. And Professor Lin will present the diagnosis and management of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Uh, so Professor Lin, please start yes. your lecture, okay? Okay, thank you very much for uh, Professor S.G. to uh, invite me to uh, share some experiences to my about the uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus. I work for Department of uh, Neurosurgery at Shenzhen Hospital in China Medical University. So uh, the clinical feature of the MTX cells is a uh, clinical syndrome that it, uh, consists of uh, classic triad of the syndrome, include uh, gait impairment, urinary incontinence, and dementia. So however, uh, this complete triad is not always seen. So the triad is uh, through to occur because of uh, impairment of uh, periventricular uh, from the uh, cortex-based ganglia cellular cortical uh, secretary in setting of the CF at high volumes. So this picture shows the CF sound floor. Uh, some disease like uh, disturbing the CF dynamic to uh, next uh, determine the brain function and uh, finally uh, get the disturbance con uh, cognitive decline as yearning syndromes. So uh, here we talk about the IMTH. So I think the great thing is called to measure uh, the security of uh, triad, and like uh, uh, continence impairment, uh, gate determinants, urinary dependence. So pathologies of the MPH cells uh, as a form of the con uh, communicating hydrocephalus. Yeah, it can be divided into the two forms. One is IMPH, one and the secondary uh, MPH. So here we talk about IMPH. So how to uh, distinguish the two types? So in uh, secondary MPH, the neurological uh, uh, caused by the primary diseases may mask the, the typical MPH syndromes. So the secondary uh, MPH may affect the very age from uh, following the initial incident and the preclinical stage in typically much shorter or weeks or a month. So IMPH caused most uh, commonly in the elderly uh, population and the uh, preclinical development of uh, IMPH is uh, gradual over years. So the outcome of the sound uh, surgery was uh, significantly better for a uh, secondary MPH than for IMPH patients. Well, the disease uh, duration of the less than one year was the more important factors. So module adjustments were found to be more frequent in IMPH than in secondary MPH cases. So, so far, so why MPH is a difficult to diagnose? So first, the triad is uh, common in older patients and it has many causes. Uh, get uh, abnormally occurs in the 20% of the individuals older than uh, age 75 and is associated with the with, uh, development of the dementia. Certainly incontinence occurs in the 38% of the women and 18% of the men at this age. So, Dementia appears in 48 of the person older than 70 years of age has have uh, dementia. So the traditional feature of the gait abnormally or dysfunctions shows a uh, gait dysfunction is uh, uh, magnetic or glue uh, fluted gait or gait acquisitions or a frontal uh, axles similar to what has been uh, depressed as the brown axles. Uh, Gate defense can be highly variable. 
is likely depend, uh, dependent on the uh, nature of the special uh, cortex-based ganglia, insolumer cortical uh, circulate disruptions. Uh, so uh, diagnosis of IMPH should focus on differentiating the gate uh, observed from the other potential cases of uh, gait abnormality in these uh, clinical populations. So uh, diagnosis should be not uh, should not be excluded if uh, magnetic gate is not seen. Here uh, shows the uh, small steps wide base or difficulty which turn uh, uh, posturally in steps lead with a, a positive to pulse test. And also uh, we can only do a scale from the one to eight for walking, as means uh, a normal to the uh, wheelchair uh, dispendent. And uh, the three meter uh, ties up and go test, we, we call the TOD test is uh, useful. And also uh, 12 disease links to gait uh, abnormality like a special disease, uh, Parkinson disease and uh, medical uh, medications uh, under alcohol abuse and so on. And the urinary incontinence, frontal lobe incontinence. So the urinary signals of the IMTH are uh, frontal lobe incontinence and include the urgency, the frequency and the urgency incontinence. So the first the urinary sense of the di uh, this uh, functions uh, includes the first uh, urinary sense of the dysfunction, which uh, then evolves into urgent urgent incontinence. So turf disease is linked to urinary incontinence, uh, include non genitourinary uh, cases and. Uh, Genitonary cases. So the common context is feature of the cognitive impairment of the dementia, like uh, some common uh, continuous features include the uh, psychomotor slow, uh, slowing, uh, decreased, decreased attention and concentration, impaired executive functions. Apostles. So the continent impaired, uh, like uh, dementia, the continent uh, in part is usually uh, described as the front, front the sub uh, cortical dementia. The exact uh, quality and uh, severity is uh, any individual will depend on individual the pattern of the cortical based ganglia. Uh, Salomon cortical uh, circulatory disruptions uh, related to the disruption of the uh, increased CFS content in the cranial volume and any combined quantified uh, possibility. So another is uh, certain disease linked to dementia. So we have to dis uh, carefully uh, adjust uh, this uh, dementia or is IMPH. So that's why I think it's a difficulty to diagnosis. So all diagnostic tests for IMPH have both uh, uh, false positive and false negative results. Includes absorption test, monitoring CSF professor, uh, system nephrography, flow in the cerebral, Arcadic and lamp puncturers, ex, uh, external to CISF drainers. And why I think this is uh, difficult to diagnose is the means uh, patient who is uh, with uh, IMPH commonly they have uh, overlaps in uh, combat disease, it means have a lot of disease overlapped including the Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and the spinal stenosis, uh, neuropathy. 
So the uh, surgical complication where uh, with the cell thing are common, uh, like mortality and uh, subdural hematoma or hemorrhage, and uh, increased hemorrhage, infection, revision. So uh, the complication rate of the IMPH decreased over years. Recently, uh, the, a lot of uh, surgeons get a uh, good result, the type of cells. So recently, the decreased uh, uh, com the complications occur. So how to diagnose it for the IMPH? So the test uh, whether a cell may improve the syndromes. So we use the most uh, is MRI imaging markers, uh, high volume lumbar puncture. Uh, we call that a top test. And also we use the external CI screener. So the later tests are not special to the pathogenesis, but evaluate the whether uh, shunt will improve the uh, symptoms. So uh, here still is a uh, MRI imaging uh, markers. This means the events uh, index uh, more than uh, 0 0.3. And also we use uh, MRI scan to uh, the compress the appear of the adjacent uh, SUSI. Uh, this picture shows the singulate uh, uh, signs. Here uh, we see it is a normal uh, Here is a IMPH sign. And also uh, the MRI cells usually as an extra flare MRI. You can see a vesicle uh, megaly with uh, some arachnoid uh, hydrocephalus. So here shows uh, an auto periventricular uh, high T2 signal in auto present, like here. So, MRI imaging markers uh, also can uh, see uh, causal angles, which so means uh, uh, significantly lower in IMPH. Here, this uh, this uh, sign. Also, as associated with a good uh, response to uh, the sound. Here, they include the three sides. One is a ventricle uh, called a megali, that means in large ventricle, and also high polluted pathogen. Uh, then uh, here is a, a close, and also in large human patients, uh, this. Uh, I don't know. And a flood collection like a pocket uh, surround, uh, surrounded by a tight. Uh, here shows this uh, pocket. Here shows the tight uh, juicy. Now, this paper shows the, the passion two and the passion one. In the passion one, it shows the uh, uh, INPH. Uh, they have the events uh, index plus causal angles and the singulate sign and the base signs. And the patient two uh, shows the uh, dementia. So, score for CSF types uh, uh, before CSF cutting in his sponsors. In sponsors. So, before uh, top test, we also use the uh, recorded the uh, MSSE or uh, FAD to, uh, to uh, measure the, the neurologic uh, finding. So the high volume of lumbar puncture test uh, or CSM type test is very useful for a job is the index. So we use the default and within uh, 30 minutes after a high volume LRP, we will see what happens. And after high volume uh, lumbar puncture test cells improvement in gait, the patient has an uh, excellent uh, change 
of improving with uh, shunting surgeries. So this test has been used to attend the higher sensitivity and specialty for diagnosing the IEPH and predicting a sound response. So external lamp, lamp pressures, uh, one measure is uh, remove 10 to 15 millimeter later size at per hour. So this study can be done for one to three days. And also the patient is evaluated for improvement in gait, uh, uh, cognitive and or uh, both. So limitations, uh, false and negatives uh, still occurs uh, similar to the lamp puncture test. And uh, also uh, infection or external uh, drainage is necessary. Uh, indications, uh, Placement is uh, considered in patients who have a negative lumbar pressure test. So when the patient, family, and the doctors are strongly with the decision to decide on surgeries. So another markers like vitamin D deficiencies may not be uh, neglected for IMPH. So originally we found uh, Vitamin D deficiency may involve the IMPI to occur. This uh, another uh, researcher report the uh, vitamin D, uh, the relationship vitamin D and IMPI. So, hypernature may be uh, overlooked for IMPI. Another marker for uh, amyloid beta uh, protein, and also see in the AD disease. So the further uh, IMP evaluation measures include the DTI or uh, MRI uh, elastography to see the visualized elasticity of the brain has also a possible future benefit in IMPH evaluations. So this uh, future uh, IMPH evaluation measure uh, use IMRS uh, to see what happened in the IMPH patients. So how to management for uh, IMPH? So surgical considerations uh, important surgical intuitive after include the three part, the use of the adjustable cells, the complication of the surgery, and the setting of the warm the opening uh, pressure. So adjustable sound uh, visitors fix the opening uh, pressure cells. So uh, recently the result is just over the past decade, Decade adjustable cells have slowly replaced the fixed uh, pressure cells. And subdural hematoma are uh, common after sound surgery. So, but adjustable cells that decreased and uh, occurred for surgery intervention. Adjustable adjusting the sound. Uh, recently, 30% were treated surgically for subdural uh, hematomas. And fixed the uh, professor sound valves, more than uh, 80% were treated with uh, surgical for subdural hematomas. So it means the uh, uh, changeable, adjustable sound is uh, a good method for the IMPH. Uh, when VP sound is the most common used treatment for the IMPH. And uh, the sound leads to a clinical improvement in 70 to 80% of the treatment patient in contrast to the other, another. Uh, often poorly treatable uh, neurodegenerative uh, disorders. So seating the opening valve suppressor, so we always, uh, when the opening valve suppressor is set to a, a level such lower than the opening RP CHF pressure, there are greater uh, chance of the 
our trainers uh, complication exist, such as uh, subdural hematoma, subdural hygroma, uh, headaches. The patient's body uh, mass index has been uh, associated with the uh, RP uh, opening pressure. With patients who are overweight have a higher RP opening pressure. So it's uh, better to set the valve opening pressure as the RP opening pressure to try to decrease overweight drainage. So I think twice of the cause of uh, gait dysfunctions and incontinence before sounding. So gait dysfunction is uh, no neurological uh, mechani uh, mechanical uh, uh, hindrance to movement. And it's uh, the most important part of the uh, tree ad. Differential uh, diagnosis is so, uh, uh, gait now, abnormally the acid age uh, groups should be kept in mind. So identifying uh, prognostic filter and the common uh, cause of uh, gait dysfunction could, and incontinence can help in evaluating in a patient for sound. So evaluation twice of patient's gait. The patient get is uh, evaluated before a high volume RP test. The patient get is uh, evaluated again within 30 minutes after removing a 30 milliliter CSF. So three measures of the gate are documented. One is the time taken from walk 10 meters, 10. Uh, 180 degrees and return to the uh, start point. And two, uh, the number of the steps needed to turn 180 degrees twice, average three. The number of the steps needed to uh, turn uh, 360 degrees three times and average. So improvement on the, any one of these uh, measurements is regarded as a gate improvement. So the key is uh, no gate abnormality in no sound. So performing sound surgery on patients with a large ventricle and no gate abnormality has not been shown to be helpful. So this was uh, first uh, noted by uh, Miller Fisher in 1978, and several other studies has confirmed it. So both large ventricle and gait abnormality should be concentrated on. So summary, IMPH is a rare uh, but treatable disease. The diagnosis can be uh, difficult because many diseases can cause cognitive uh, impairment, incontinence, and gait dysfunction. So treating with a well-selected patient can result in clinical improvement. But the risk and the benefit of the sound procedures must be weighed. So recent improvement in understanding the neuroimaging features of the IMPH have allowed improved identification and the selection of the patient with IMPH. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Kindly unmute your mic. <laughs> yes, we can hear you, Professor Takar. Uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Ling, uh, thank you for your nice presentation. You uh, focused uh, mainly on the diagnosis of uh, INPH, and uh, you you have mentioned very good point because uh, most uh, uh, neurologists or neurosurgeons uh, uh, diagnose the uh, INPH patient uh, by lumbar tap. Uh, and the evaluating um, timing is one day after or one week after. You mentioned 
only within 30 minutes. Uh, that's a very important point. But uh, uh, you mentioned the INPH is a rare disease. Uh, I don't think so because uh, I have already uh, over 1,000 patients uh, treated by shunt in this 10 years. So I think it is very common disease for the elderly people and uh, uh, many patients are misdiagnosed by uh, as uh, Parkinson or Alzheimer or uh, vascular dementia. Uh, what do you think about this? <laughs> okay, thank you. That's a good question. So uh, uh, I talk about a rare case uh, because uh, recently we uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of the surgeons uh, find a lot of patients. So we have to carefully to screen the uh, patients. So far, uh, 10 years ago, this is a rare case, but the reason is, is a lot of cases. So <laughs> I means you have to pay attention, pay attention to screen the, the patients. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Professor Takagi. I, I would like to mention you, uh, one of two interesting articles you wrote. One is the inter-observable variability of uh, the colossal angle. Carlos and Angel. Huh? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, 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 many uh, studies have done for the uh, image diagnosis for INPH. And uh, uh, mostly, uh, most studies from Europe and the uh, United States, uh, they uh, say that uh, it is very difficult to uh, diagnose only by CT or MRI, uh, especially from Sweden group uh, denied the importance of uh, uh, causal angle or any types of uh, uh, diagnostic marker for, of uh, image. So the best uh, diagnostic uh, uh, procedure is uh, uh, Check the patient uh, symptoms, uh, gauge disturbance, uh, dementia, or urinary incontinence. And if there is some dilatation of uh, ventric ventricular systems, uh, do not hesitate, lumbar type test. Uh, I think it is the best uh, choice. So uh, I don't have uh, so. My usually uh, clinical uh, work do not pay attention to causal angle. It's okay for you. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much, <laughs> Professor Lin Yunhui. I would like to ask one question: Is it uh, always necessary to treat a subdural hematoma following a lumbar peritoneal shunt? Because sometimes the patient may not be symptomatic with regards to that hematoma. Do you okay. adv advocate treatment for that? So, so uh, if you use uh, 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 adjustable, adjustable uh, uh, tube or the drainage uh, device, so you can change up. Uh, we don't need. Uh, uh, we don't need uh, surgery. Yes. Uh, first, we we need uh, change up at the pressure, the opening pressure, to see what happened. So it doesn't work. We secondary, uh, secondary, we can uh, uh, consider the operation procedure procedures. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Professor Takagi, your views on this? Uh, well, I prefer ventricular atrial shunt, and uh, I experienced about uh, forty or fifty percent of of the patient uh, have the subdural hematoma, but it is very thin. And only uh, about 2% patient need surgery. Uh, usually, I, uh, as uh, Professor Lin uh, level up the uh, shunt valve, uh, it is my usual procedure. And also, 
I prescribe uh, steroid prednisone uh, 30 milligram one day and for uh, two weeks. It is very uh, good for cure the uh, uh, conservative treatment of subdural hematoma uh, by over drainage. Um, but uh, there is no evidence. Uh, uh, it is not evidence based, but uh, personally. <laughs> We understand. Okay. Yes, Dr. Libun Seng, any questions from you? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Professor, I just want to know that uh, the, the failure of response to uh, treatment is because they are not using programmable shunt. And do you advocate all patients with idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus to use uh, programmable shunt to be successful? Thank you, Professor. For me? Yeah. Yes, I, 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 always, I always use program of above and uh, uh, at the surgery, I set a high level and then gradually decreased. Uh, in sometimes it requires uh, over three years to reach the uh, maxima, uh, uh, excellent uh, setting. Professor Yunhui, what about you? Yes, uh, in, in my department, uh, we always use uh, a changeable uh, device, means uh, uh, program the uh, like uh, uh, B bronze device, like uh, Ask Labs device, uh, and uh, we rarely use the fixed ball uh, drainer device. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. And Professor Shubin, any remarks from your side? Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you, Raja. And uh, uh, Professor Liu, thank you very much for your very uh, uh, informative uh, presentation. So uh, I wonder that, uh, uh, did you have ever tried the LP shunt, when, which means from the lumbar uh, system to the Final shunt. Uh, okay, this is. It also question. have some adjustable. Uh, uh, yes, I yeah. I think a lot of uh, Japanese researchers use a uh, LP uh, shunt, but I have uh, uh, not much experience because uh, it's very uh, uh, difficult to adjust this uh, to LP and VP. So recently, a lot of uh, researchers report. LP uh, have a lot of uh, problems, and uh, VP is a uh, uh, better or a uh, uh, suggest a uh, method for the uh, I uh, NPH patients. Okay, how uh, Takaki, uh, Professor Takaki, how do you think? Well, uh, in Japan, uh, most neurosurgeons prefer uh, LP shunt, and about seventy percent of NPH uh, are treated by LP shunt. And uh, uh, the problem is uh, uh, all the patient has uh, some lumbar disease. So uh, it is very, in some patient, it is very difficult to insert uh, uh, lumbar uh, catheter. And uh, another problem is uh, about 1% of the patient uh, received LP shunt have uh, 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 catheter damage uh, rupture. Uh, one percent of per year, and uh, uh, and the the frequency of uh, uh, over drainage is much higher than VP. So I personally prefer VHN, and uh, uh, the result is I think it's very good. Yes, me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in that case, we'll close this session. I would like to hear the concluding remarks from Professor Takagi. Uh, thank you for this good chance to uh, discuss uh, about INPH. Uh, thank you, Raja. Uh, good organization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Shubin. Thank you, Raja. Yeah. yeah Tonight, uh, uh, it's around the 1,000 audience. Watch this webinar.
thank you thank you so much <laughs> so i'll wind this up officially now uh, thank you very much both the speakers and chairs on behalf of the education committee of the acns and the president professor yoko kato i would like to thank both the speakers professor roy thomas daniel and professor lin yunhui and the chairs professor ibrahim sba and professor kyushi takagi for the time and support for the acns webinars i would also like to thank my co-host for today dr lubun singh a special thanks to professor shubin for his relentless support for us and this webinars he has been instrumental in arranging the speakers from china and helping us to reach a wider audience in his country that i have been updated that today there are more close to 1000 people and it is a great uh, platform to learn for every young neurosurgeon so until we all meet on the 28th of july it is bye bye from all of us thank you very much for joining <laughs>